Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining this webinar. As Carrie said, I'm Jelena Savic, and I was uh, part of the ROB2 development team. Uh, in today's seminar, I will cover the overall risk of bias and um, what, what do we do with these uh, ROB2 assessments once we've done them. Okay, so um, the, the outline for today is a very brief overview of, of the ROB2 process. Uh, we'll talk about how we reach overall uh, ROB2 judgment. Uh, and um, we'll go then and spend most of uh, the session uh, talking about the, uh, the three main options for incorporating ROB2 into the synthesis. And we'll hopefully have some time for questions and, and we have a, a few polls for you. Um, so here is the quick summary of the ROB2 process. We first need to uh, determine which results to assess. For each of the key synthesis in the review, we first identify which studies potentially contribute to it. And then for uh, each, um, uh, for number one, uh, we identify the result from each study that we would like to use in the synthesis uh, to we specify the effect of interest. This is covered, this was covered in detail in webinar three. Three. Uh, then uh, the next step is for transparency, it is useful to note which sources, such as journal articles, protocol, registry records, uh, have been used to inform the risk of bias assessment. And the uh, blocks four and five here are the actual role of assessment, which includes answering signaling questions, uh, judgments to make for each domain. And these were all covered individually in um, detail in webinars two to six. And we come now to the uh, sixth block here, which is uh, what we will cover today. We need to make an overall judgment to risk of bias. Uh, and once we have done that, so we have completed our risk of bias assessment, the next step is the synthesis. We uh, need to use the risk of bias judgments for the synthesis uh, and we we'll also need to uh, integrate the judgments across the studies uh, that contribute to the meta-analysis for example uh, and we will consider several options for integrating these judgments to synthesis today. Uh, an important uh, aspect here to mention is that the, uh, the next step is that the integrated judgment across studies um, will then feed into one of the factors in GRADE, the risk of bias component of GRADE uh, assessment of certainty of evidence. And briefly, this is a snapshot of the entire tool. We can see the five domains uh, here with their signaling questions and their domain level judgments. Uh, and once we have answered all the questions and reached the main level judgments, then we uh, have to make the overall risk of bias judgment, which is shown here at the bottom. So these are the rules for the, pro uh, the proposed rules for reaching the overall risk of uh, bias judgment. And as a general rule, the highest risk of bias judgment across the domains determines the overall risk of bias. But it's easier to show uh, how this works on an illustrated example, which I have on the next slide. So we have several scenarios here. To get to the low overall risk of bias judgment, we need to have low risk of bias in all five domains. If there is a mixture of low risk of bias in some concerns across the domains, like in this second case, we have a couple, then the result uh, is at some concerns overall. If at least one domain has a high risk of bias judgment, then the overall risk of bias judgment for the result is high. This is another example, but we just have a mixture of everything, but we still go with the, with the highest risk of bias. There is no higher than high, so it's high. Uh, and in this last example, um, if we have several domains which have some 
concerns. You might judge that the accumulation of these concerns is sufficient to call the overall result as high risk of bias. But this is the, uh, the judgment that the user uh, needs to make uh, and usually provide some justification explaining what are these concerns and how the accumulation is, is in increasing the, the risk. Uh, the ROC2 framework allows users to override the, uh, the rules specified in this table uh, for, for each of the domains. So it will be for the domains and for overall. Uh, there is an algorithm for reaching domain level judgments, and, and this is basically the algorithm for reaching the overall judgment. But all of them can be overridden, but some uh, justification should be uh, provided for that. Uh, and this is uh, just the, uh, the Excel tool, which is available to download from the ROG2 website, which has integrated decision algorithm for both domain level, but also for the overall risk of bias. So here, this we are now. Uh, this is the view of the overall risk of bias. So you, you have to click on each of these tabs to see uh, separate domains. But we are on the overall bias domain, and you can see here what are the judgments for each domain. Uh, and then when you click on this button, it will display what's the algorithm result. And then you can agree with that and enter here the same, or you can uh, have a different decision and, and then just write here or write justification. So this is a handy tool and probably re recommend this for using because it does help. Um, as for, it's relatively easy for overall, but for the individual domains, it's handy to have the algorithm built in. So I think for the easy bit now, there's the more complicated stuff. Um, so this is an example um, of a completed risk of bias assessment um, um, presented in a, um, in a, a Redmond web table. Uh, it's from uh, uh, one of the reviews that's uh, taken part in the pilot. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, so you have completed your risk of bias assessment uh, for all your key results that you are putting in your main meta-analysis and you produce uh, lovely tables like this. Um, and then the question is, what 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 is next? What would you do next with it? Uh, we can do some more presentation. Uh, this is also from Revman Web. Uh, and I guess an important point to make here, because risk of bias assessments are specific to results and therefore to the outcomes of a meta-analysis, uh, the assessment should be presented and discussed alongside the meta-analysis result for each outcome to which, to which they contribute. So in, in this case, we can display the uh, risk of bias judgment, both by domain, but also overall, uh, inside the forest plot, and they're kind of aligned with the result for which their assessment was. But this is the result, and this is its risk of bias assessment, and they're next to each other, which is, I think, really neat feature of, of Rev and Rev. In, in the so we can see this risk of bias is A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, it legibly explains which is which domain, and F here is the overall risk of bias. Okay, so we, we can do the tables, or we can um, present them in in the forest plot. And I think this is presenting them in the forest plot is a sort of a first step of it, them being integrated in the meta analysis. In this case. Uh, we have all studies included, but we have just this visual representation. But can we do more than that? What can we do with these assessments? So let's go back to what it says in the handbook. In chapter seven, it says, it is not appropriate to present analysis and interpretations while ignoring flaws identified during the assessment of risk of bias. It's not appropriate, but it's also misleading to the readers to just ignore all the risk of bias that we have done and present just all the results without any reference to risk of bias assessments. But we all know that. The question is, how, how do we how do we incorporate? And again, chapter seven recommends three main approaches. There are 
Uh, well, there are several options available, but today we'll cover the, the three. Uh, ideally, we want to give a reduced weight to studies at high risk of bias, but we don't currently have convenient methods for determining exactly what weight should be used. There are some advanced weighting, statistical weighting methods, but those are not universally accepted or particularly user-friendly. They're quite advanced Bayesian methods. Uh, so I will. Uh, this is the only thing I will say about them. I will not uh, discuss them today. So one option is to restrict the analysis to studies at uh, low overall risk of bias or studies at low risk of bias and those with some concerns. That would be some sort of uh, auto decision. Alternatively, uh, one could present results stratified by the risk of bias so that readers can see all of the results for themselves. Stratification of forest plots by risk of bias is generally encouraged. Um, we can, in addition to stratification, we can use some further techniques uh, to explore the impact of risk of bias on the size of intervention effects across the study. So we could do subgroup analysis and meta regression. Uh, and finally, we could just do an active summary of the risk of bias assessments uh, provided in the results section or discussion and just uh, combine all studies uh, of, of various risk of bias possible. And I'll now go into a bit more detail for each of these approaches. So option one, restrict the analysis to studies at low overall risk of bias or combine low risk and some concerns. How strict you choose to go will probably depend on how much evidence is available at low, low risk of bias. Uh, and it's a, a, a decision for the author team to do this. It might be that decision can be made at the protocol stage, but it might be that you just don't end up with enough studies at low risk of bias and, and that might not be the most uh, useful option. Now this is a relatively simple approach with risk of bias too uh, as we now have the overall risk of bias judgment which didn't exist in the original Kotlin tool. We just had the domains but not a way of putting it together. Uh, in addition to the primary analysis which is restricted to um, stronger studies, a sensitivity analysis uh, could also be done to examine or should also be done to examine the impact of restricting to uh, stronger studies or not restricting to analysis to stronger studies. Sensitivity analysis does not mean uh, presenting multiple versions of your results. It, would, uh, it may be useful to discuss the difference between the results including all studies and the results including only the lower risk studies. Uh, but presenting multi multiple answers may be confusing for readers, especially decision makers who, who like to just have one estimate. Uh, the primary analysis strategy should be chosen in advance and specified in the protocol. So the, the, the decision whether to restrict and what will be the primary analysis. But, but you might necessarily not be able to um, decide or you might decide that you only want low risk of bias studies in your primary analysis but you don't have any in the end so that might change your uh, original decision so what are the potential problems with this approach well there is a trade-off between precision and bias here restricting to the stronger studies may reduce bias but it may increase imprecision because of the smaller amount of information available. Including all available studies decreases imprecision, but also produces a result with a higher risk of bias. Uh, and possibly worth adding here that that, that kind of trade-off might come out in the wash once you kind of insert the result into grade because a grade assesses both bias and precision. So if you have a, a study that's restricted to low risk of bias, you'll have a, um, in your grade, you'll have uh, no concerns for bias, but you might then downgrade for precision 
order or vice versa. Okay, that was the first approach. Um, the second approach kind of uses the same tools that we use to assess heterogeneity. In fact, bias is a key potential source of heterogeneity, so we can use the same tools uh, that are used to explore heterogeneity to explore bias. So we can use subgroup analysis, a formal test for difference between subgroups, or meta-regression, which will calculate the difference or ratios of subgroup estimates and uh, confidence intervals. Subgroup analysis is available in Revman, uh, and this is probably addressed in more detail in, in the handbook chapter on heterogeneity. Um, so all of, the, all of the details of how to do it are, are, are probably in the chapter on uh, heterogeneity more than in the bias chapters. Meta-regression is a more compl complex technique and is not available in Redman, uh, and it may require some statistical expertise to undertake and interpret meta-regression. So that brings us to, this, to the second approach, which will involve producing multiple analysis stratified by the overall risk of bias or subgroup analysis. Um, so an author can create a forest plot with all studies stratified by overall risk of bias. Uh, what this means is that we end up with multiple estimates. The overall estimates for all study, estimate for all studies, uh, subgroup estimate for lower risk of bias, stu bias studies, and a subgroup estimate for higher risk of bias studies. And I say lower and higher rather than low and high to highlight that there is a decision to be made by the author team on how to handle studies with some concern judgment, where to combine them, what to combine them with. So this is an example of a forest plot uh, from um, uh, a review, uh, which subgroups are risk of bias. Um, at the top, uh, we have study results with low overall risk of bias. In the middle, we have some concerns, and at the bottom, high risk of bias. And then at the very bottom, you can see the diamond that includes the summary estimate for all studies. Uh, so this um, group of authors has chosen to uh, do a subgroup analysis across all three categories, uh, but some might choose to combine some concerns with, with one or the other category. Uh, what can we conclude from, from this, from the subgroups? Um, the three subgroups estimates are somewhat different but they, um, all of the confidence intervals overlap. Uh, we can look at whether splitting them according to bias categories has um, reduced heterogeneity, but there is no evidence of that. We had I square here about 80% and very small p-value, um, and this um, is pretty much still the case in the subgroups, except for a bit of reduction here, but nothing to write home about. Um, so this provide some more information. In this particular case, um, uh, it doesn't uh, particularly um, tell us what, whether the differences um, uh, are meaningful in some way, uh, but in some cases it can. Uh, so what are the disadvantages of this approach? Well, mainly the, there are more decisions to be made, and uh, let's look at some examples here. So I have two examples here, which are polls. Um, so uh, I'll get you to look at the, um, the slide uh, for a bit, uh, so that you actually see what's in it, make your decision before, because once the poll is on, you won't be able to see this graph anymore. So this is an example of a subgroup analysis by risk of bias. It's a very old example, so um, probably not up to date or anything. So ignore the actual result. We're just looking at the difference. We have subgroups by risk of bias. Uh, the, uh, the plot does not show separate estimates for individual included studies, just subgroup summary estimates and confidence intervals. Uh, 
So we have, these are all the trials with low risk of bias and uh, their summary, subgroup summary estimate, subgroup summary estimate for high risk of bias. And we have all studies together in a meta-analysis, full, all meta-analysis, uh, the entire meta-analysis estimate. Um, so we can see there's some difference between low and high risk of bias. Uh, if, if people have had enough time to look at this, then maybe we can switch to a poll. So based on low risk of bias trials only, 41% uh, of people have voted for that. Based on okay. high risk of bias trials only, 1% has voted on that. And based on all trials, 58%. Okay. Well, so uh, I mean, I don't really have a correct answer for this. I guess that's the whole point of these examples. Uh, but I have another another poll and another example. So let's look at this one. Um, different meta-analysis here are completely different interventions. Uh, same situations, we don't see any individual studies. We have a summary estimate for the subgroup of low risk of bias trials, a subgroup high risk of bias trials, and all trials. And they really overlap. They're very similar. So I have exactly the same question for the audience. Okay, so we have 18% have said low risk of bias, 2% have said high risk of bias, and 80% have said based on all trials. Okay, so so there is um, a, a, a big group of people who would use all trials in both cases. And we have a little bit of reduction of people just restricting to low risk of bias here. Uh, I mean, very few people said they would only use high risk of bias trials, which I think maybe they probably pressed the wrong button. I don't know why you would just choose high risk of bias trials. Um, so that's probably the wrong answer, <laughs> but, but there is no right answer in the sense that uh, it's a difficult decision to make for all the various reasons we already mentioned. Um, what I would say is, Although there is no right answer whether to pick just low or all of them, it's generally unwise to pick your main analysis on the basis of seeing the result. So, uh, and also it would be it would be quite silly to kind of have say if these two were in the same review that for one, say for this one you you said ah oh, for this one I'll pick just low risk of bias trials and for this I'll I'll put everything in. Uh, just based on looking at the results. So that, that would definitely be wrong. So these, that's why you say these kind of decisions probably should be um, or should be defined in the protocol. Uh, so um, a few additional slides related to, to these um, subgroup analysis. So we have, um, we could also carry out a meta regression and formally compare the subgroup statistically. And this is the graph from your first poll where they, they looked uh, quite different uh, or somewhat different. But the metrogression suggests there is no strong, ev strong evidence that subgroups are statistically different. We have um, um, a ratio was ratio that's uh, you know smaller than one, but the confidence interval is very wide. And in fact, if, if you look at these two subgroups, they do overlap. So you'd expect that you wouldn't get a um, um, a test the difference that um, that will show the difference, and we've done the same for uh, for the second example. And this is what we would expect: the ratio what the ratio is, is close to one, and again, wide confidence into. Uh, so, uh, some cautions with these tests of, of differences and, and meta regressions. These examples illustrate that we should be cautious when interpreting subgroup analysis and meta regression. Um, individual reviews may not have enough studies in each risk or bias category to identify meaningful difference. And just because the confidence interval for meta regression estimate crosses the null, it, it does not guarantee absence of bias. And conversely, even if you observe a significant difference between subgroups by risk or bias, the observed difference may not necessarily be due to bias. There could be other sources of heterogeneity. So these are all caveats we use in these methods can be useful, but be cautious when interpreting them. So 
So the second approach, the, the multiplicity approach, the approach of using subgroup analysis in various tests, allows us to explore how summary estimates differ across the bias categories. But it does create a multiplicity of data. It means that there will be three estimates for each meta-analysis outcome. And we need to make a decision which one is the main result, which one goes to summary finding statement. Displaying three estimates may be confusing for the reader and decision makers just want to see a single estimate. And the summary of findings just require a single outcome for a single estimate for a, me uh, a meta-analysis outcome. Uh, the review team does need to make these decisions. Well, we saw from the examples in the poll that it is unwise to make such decisions on the basis of results of post hoc. It is better that these are decided at protocol stage. And I would say that the main advantage of this approach is transparency. It is, it is also very thorough and it can be informative to explore these differences. Okay, so before moving on to the third approach, I would actually like to highlight that these first two approaches are the mainstay in approaches for considering risk of, risk of bias, certainly in Cochrane reviews. Uh, and if, if, if those were your kind of main options, how would you decide which one to choose? I can't really give you the answer. I don't have a simple answer and it is a review team decision. Uh, and I guess the main factor in deciding this, um, it should be, uh, the decision should be based um, on the balance between the potential for bias and the loss of precision resulting from exclusion of higher risk of bias studies. Okay, and the final approach, the third approach is to include all studies in the synthesis and provide a, a narrative summary of risk of bias uh, in the results section of the review, possibly in the discussion. And uh, this is often accompanied by displaying and describing summary of risk of bias across all studies, uh, and um, ideally also displaying um, rock judgments uh, on the forest plot like we've uh, seen in an example earlier or like in this example. That is still all descriptive uh, com uh, comparing to the previous two methods which which somehow integrate, make some decisions into what consists the main analysis. Is this the simplest approach? Well, maybe it is for some people because it appears to be the most common across published reviews, not necessarily in Cochrane, uh, because Cochrane suggests the previous two approach to be the mainstay approaches. Uh, but it certainly is in, in published reviews um, across various journals. But what are the problems with it? What are the um, potential issues? Descriptions of risk or bias are often buried somewhere in the results of discussion sections. They rarely make it to the abstract summary of findings or conclusions, which means that potentially biased estimates get prominence. And it does not downweight studies at high risk of bias. So overall estimate is too precise as well as potentially biased. We want to have the precise estimate, but not we don't want inflated precision. Why do we even list this if, if it's bad? Well, I mean, it's not bad, but it's, it's not necessarily adequate. But, but maybe there are situations when it may be acceptable to do that. It's okay to include all studies and a narrative description of risk of bias when all studies are at the same risk of bias. But it is actively discouraged when studies have different risks of bias. And it is essential to ensure that summary risk of bias assessment is incorporated 
um, into the explicit measures of the certainty of evidence, which is great. So that, that would be, in this case, that would really be the only mechanism in which you can reflect the um, risk of bias in the certainty of evidence. Um, um, if, um, but if all studies are at the same risk of bias, that would be um, appropriate. Uh, it would be okay to do that. Okay, so I've, um, I've covered the three methods, the main methods, and this is just a summary of, of all, all of them. So once authors have completed the risk of bias assessments and presented them in some suitable format, they would then have to decide what should be included in the primary analysis. There are two mainstay approaches, restricting to lower risk of bias studies and a stratified analysis. Subgroup analysis and metrogression can help authors to explore differences in estimates by subgroup. A sensitivity analysis may also be useful, especially if we decide to restrict to lower risk of bias studies, and then we could do a sensitivity analysis, including all studies, and, and kind of discuss the impact of that. Um, and finally, the overall risk of bias across studies included in the primary synthesis outcome will then feed directly into grade assessment for that outcome, grade assessment of certainty of evidence. And this, I think, shows how everything links together. Okay, so now that uh, we've covered all of that, I have another poll question for the audience. So now that you've listened to all this and based on your previous experience, which method will you use in your next review? Would you restrict to lower risk of bias studies or results? Will you do subgroup risk of bias, explore things with metrogression, um, include all studies and describe relevant text or something entirely different? Okay, so we have 10% saying they'd restrict to lower risk of bias results. 60% have said they would undertake subgroups by risk of bias or use meta-regression. 25% have said they would include all studies and describe risk of bias in the text. And 5% have said something else. Okay, interesting. So this restriction to lower risk of bias studies is really unpopular. And I, I think just people don't like to throw things away. Um, subgroups, I think that's probably, I see that a lot in review, in Cochrane review, so that, that is used a lot and it is, it is nice to explore things, but I still have a lot of, a group of resistant people here who will still include everything and just discuss, discuss Rob in the text, um, but I don't know if they maybe know that, that all of their risk of bias assessment will be the same, so it's appropriate, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Again, there's no correct answer here. Uh, these decisions are complex. I don't know what something else is, but uh, perhaps some people can share with us the new methods. Okay, I'm just quickly going to uh, go over some of the resources. These, these were already mentioned in previous webinars, but um, it, it might be handy to, for people to um, uh, to know what's available. So the, the first bit here is the Excel tool, which I've already shown you that there's, um, it is just an Excel spreadsheet, but it has like a front end forms in which you can enter the, the results um, or the decisions neatly, and that will input them into the spreadsheet, which you, which you can then export. Um, do we know, is this possible to export into Revman Web? Is this compatible at this stage? Not at the moment. We're waiting um, the, for the online version, and I think the Revman Web team are then going to work with that to be able to import that into Revman Web. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the biggest advantage of this is Excel, er, everyone knows how to use it, but um, also that the uh, domain level and uh, overall judgment uh, decisions uh, algorithms are built in, so um, you, you don't have to you know, look at the um, those colourful algorithms yourself. It will just give you the suggested answer. Uh, this is an online platform uh, uh, that we have been building. Um, it's coming soon. We, we're still in some sort of negotiating uh, stages with the University of Bristol to, to actually make it available online. But uh, we hope that uh, 
within a few months, this will become available. So it's a full tool um, to use online. Uh, we uh, know that Covidence are uh, developing the, the ROB2 platform. At the moment, it's still ROB1 in it. Uh, Revman Web has it, but not the, um, the desktop version, Revman 5. Uh, and this is a RobViz tool, which you can also access from the uh, Risco Bias website, which uh, uh, allows you to create this visual um, this uh, visual plots of, of, of Rob um, to presentations. Um, obviously, uh, the uh, the main kind of knowledge is in the Cochrane Handbook. In uh, the relevant chapters are seven um, and eight, and uh, also uh, messier items. Um, summarize the handbook by guidance. There's a lot of information on the riscobias.info website, which includes the full detailed 70-page guidelines with rationales and examples and, um, and just explaining the, the, the methodology and, and, and why, um, why the, the tool um, works as it does.